All right. Well, I want to welcome everybody to our webinar. Um, and I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen here and we're going to go to presenter mode here. Um, my name is Bill Reichert and I am the National Director for Campus right. and Community well, Ministries. I want to welcome everybody to our webinar. And um, hang on. And I'm going to all right. Sorry about that. That was I was getting some audio feedback on our live stream. We are going to push this through our YouTube live stream and uh, make that available if we have an overflow, in particular for our time together. Um, I am joined here with uh, Nicole Hayes, our Washington D.C. Uh, area director. Welcome, Nicole. Welcome, welcome everyone. Hey, Bill. Good to see you. Well, I want to thank everybody for taking the time, uh, taking a pause in your schedule and to be able to join us today. Um, this is the webinar created in his image, Reversing Racism's Effects on Health and Healthcare. And uh, before we dive in, uh, I want to kind of just uh, tee up uh, what we're going to be doing during our time together. So uh, very briefly, myself and Nicole are going to have an opportunity for some opening remarks. And then we're going to have an introduction of our panelists. And then we're going to present a couple of poll questions because we, we like to read the room and see what you're all thinking about this uh, subject. Uh, we'll, we'll pray and then we'll have individual time with each of the panelists, a conversation, and then we'll have some extended time for a question and answer. And uh, it's at that time we are, we're going to be relying on you to provide some of the questions. And so one of the features and functions of this webinar is the Q&A. And so we're going to be pointing you there for questions uh, that you want to pose for our panelists. Uh, we ask you not to put those into in the uh, chat function, uh, but rather it'll help us better organize it through the Q&A function. So go ahead and do that. And we've also opened up um, the upvoting. So if you see a question in particular that is of interest to you, you can upvote that and that will allow us to know what questions are really resonating with the group as a whole. So take advantage of that. Now, before we dive in too, let me just explain a little bit about why we're doing this webinar together. Um, it may appear first blush that uh, we're having this conversation purely because of the uh, events in the news and the things that are happening within our communities that have gripped our, our attention, our thoughts and prayers. But the truth is that this is a, uh, our time together is not merely a reaction to the current events. Although I would argue it is providentially placed. Uh, but rather, this is an important conversation that uh, CMDA has been having and is continuing to have amongst its members. And so this webinar has actually been weeks in the planning. Um, also, I think this webinar, the importance of this webinar is that this is an important conversation that we need to be having. And one of the elements in combating racism and finding and seeking reconciliation starts with awareness. And as a white evangelical male, I, I know it's important for me as I enter this conversation to take a posture of learning, listening, and seeking to understand before being understood. And I trust that'll be the kind of posture we'll all have as we have this time together. Let me uh, now turn over to Nicole to kind of speak in, in, into some of the whys, uh, why we're doing this time together. Nicole? Thank you, Bill. And good afternoon to everyone. And so grateful for you all joining us today. It's a timely and providential conversation as my colleague Bill just shared. And I'm grateful that hearts are being stirred and hearts are being affected to be part of the solution uh, in this time. Uh, who you'll meet uh, on this webinar will be uh, Dr. Omari Hodge. He is a dear brother in Christ out of Atlanta, a black physician who uh, I met first uh, last year at our CMDA national convention. I met him and his wife, Kira, and from, from then we've had a great fellowship that we've enjoyed since then. Hi, Amari, my dear brother. Good to see you. And I have to say that uh, Omari uh, called me on May 9th, and we were both talking about and lamenting about the uh, killing of Ahmad Aubrey in Georgia. And as many of you were lamenting and praying and uh, dealing with that loss, it was then that he said, Nicole, we have to do something. And the Lord really placed a burden on his heart to do something to, in response to this. And because we're a healthcare ministry, we said, you know, we would do this through the lens of healthcare and how racism affects, uh, racism affects health and healthcare. 
Well, as we were planning the event, and mind you, this was May 9th when my dear brother called me. And I'm very much a planner and thinking, okay, when do we want to do this? And he's like, we need to do this now. We need to respond to this now. So we began planning. God began to put on our hearts the people, the panelists he want, wanted us to have uh, on um, this panel discussion. And God began to bring the elements together. I mean, thanks to our panelists who you'll, who you'll be meeting here very shortly. Uh, CMDA, our, our family, CMDA family, Bill, Pam, Janie, and many others who are Mike, Dr. Mike Chupp, our CEO, uh, many people who have been involved in pull, pulling this together in three weeks. Well, fast forward to not barely three weeks into our planning, and yet we have yet another horrific fatality and murder of uh, George Floyd in Minneapolis by at the hands of some wicked police officers, no, no less. And so here we are grieving and mourning, not only individually, but collectively as a nation and as a world. We are mourning this horrific loss that has been not only um, captured, on, captured on video. So uh, both of us have been sensing this, and I feel like the way that the events have come together here, the Lord is really providentially moving for us to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. I will say that it was uh, during this week that we've had a number of conversations. A dear, a dear white friend in deepest sincerity and deepest perplexity asked me, how did we get here? Mm -hmm. And my response is, we've been here for some time. And so in response to that, we can go back to 400 years as African-Americans being brought here as slaves. And we can go even before that to the transatlantic slave trade. So uh, I'm glad, grateful that you all are here and wanting to be part of this conversation. I'm grateful. Um, we're talking about how racism affects health and health care. Mm -hmm. It has been said that we live and die by our zip codes. African-American women die at more than twice the rate of other women when it comes to during pregnancy and, and childbirth. African-American adults experience higher rates of comorbidities, hypertension, diabetes, and other chronic illnesses. The life expectancy of African-Americans, often tied to their zip codes, can be significant differences between three to seven years of life expectancy than other uh, uh, groups of color. We are, all, we are here because of the legacy of structural racism, a legacy that is still very much with us and showing up in the hearts of mankind and is being laid bare through our policing, our housing, our healthcare, our education systems, and our penal systems, our employment. The pandemic has, has also so bringingly and sadly made very plain the effects of structural racism as Blacks disproportionately account for many of the COVID-19 U.S. deaths. So how do we collectively as Christians, as faith leaders, as healthcare professionals, reverse racism's effects on health and healthcare? Well, here to help us unpack this issue to some degree, our panelists, um, I'm going to introduce to you now, I'm going to introduce to you Dr. Rick Donlin. Uh, he's a um, medicine and pediatrics doctor who has lived and worked in the Memphis inner city. We'll be talking with Rick about his, first, his work of 30 years now providing healthcare to low income African Americans and his desire to welcome more Christian healthcare professionals in that good work. Rick, good to see you. We also to, thank, you. thank you, Rick. We also want to introduce you to my colleague and friend, Dr. Amari Hodge. Uh, he is uh, a family physician who lives in Marietta, Georgia. Dr. Hodge has a variety of roles within CMDA and has helped to draft CMDA's current statement on racism. We'll be talking with Omari on how he experiences racism and healthcare as a black physician. We also want to welcome Brian and Tara Frakes. Uh, Tara is a family and sports medicine physician. She and her husband, Brian, uh, reside in Wisconsin. He is an educator and they have the uh, experience and the challenge of raising two adopted African-American young sons. So we'll be talking about them with, on those experiences and the challenge and they hope and the hope they have for their two African-American sons. So welcome to the Frakes for joining us. And last, I wanna to introduce to you our dear sister in Christ and uh, physician, Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford. Uh, she practices and teaches at Massachusetts General Hospital. Harvard Medical School as one of the first fellowship trained obesity medicine physicians in the world. 
we'll be talking with Fatima about how racism can act as a social de determinant of health and how it can cause inflammation in the body as a stressor and what policies or measures might help remove structural racism so everyone has an equal opportunity at a quality of life. So thank you and welcome to each of you and everyone here. Bill? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Nicole. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we, uh, we're gonna have an opportunity before we dive in to take the temperature of the room, kind of read the room in terms of your experience uh, and uh, how you have uh, experienced racism within medicine. And so we've got a poll here and we'd invite you to uh, answer these questions. There are two very brief questions and I'm gonna launch it now and you're gonna see it on your screen. If you go ahead and would uh, vote and uh, we're not going to linger here long, it'll just take a, a couple of seconds and um, we'll wait for the voting to come in. And then once we've hit a threshold here, we're still a little under 50%. So go ahead and still take the opportunity to vote on this poll. The two questions are before you. Do you believe that racism influences the way medicine is practiced? And do you believe that racism influences the way you practice medicine? And we're just a little above 50%. I'll give you all just a couple of seconds more before I end the poll and show the, the results. And I'm gonna end the poll right now. We're just about three quarters of the way in terms of participation. And let me share those results. 72% uh, of you have said yes to the first question, that you believe racism influences the way medicine is practiced. And um, it's kind of split somewhat evenly, yes and no. Uh, do you believe that racism influences the way you practice medicine with a uh, sometimes coming out ahead just under 50%? So mm. that's very helpful for us as we enter into this conversation with one another. So let me... Um, Close that up real quick. And we are going to, uh, we're going to take a moment here. I'm going to invite Omari Hodge, Dr. Hodge, to go ahead and turn back his camera and his microphone. And uh, we're going to begin our first interview with Dr. Hodge. Uh, but before we dive in, I think it would be important for us to take a strategic pause and to really ask for the Lord's blessing upon our time together. And I've asked Dr. Hodge to do just that, is to, to lead us just in a moment of prayer. Thanks, Bill. I really appreciate that. And thanks, uh, Nicole and Bill, for having me. Wonderful introductions. And I'm so excited. So, yeah, without further ado, uh, Lord, I just thank you for this opportunity to gather. Um, it's so many of us from so many different backgrounds, so many different ways of life. But God, we're all similar in that we all lean and need you. Father God, we need healing, both within our community, within CMDA and in our nation, God. Like never before, Father God, we I pray, oh Lord, that people would begin to learn to hear first and hear the heart of others before they speak, Father God. I pray that we would allow you to change us from the inside out. And most importantly, remove any scales from our eyes that may be stopping us from seeing things from a different angle. Um, not to say that our truths aren't truth, but that there's many different ways of seeing a situation. And Father God, we we're here because we want to see what you have to say about the situation. And now my hope is that as a collective, Father God, we will each touch on uh, your heart and the things that you want us to understand about this very important conversation and that the people who are watching this will leave changed and ready to talk and engage in some meaningful way. We love you. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Amari. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's dive in. Let's have a conversation, and sure. uh, let me um, let me start off, Mari, by starting in a much more personal way. Your yeah. your intersection, your experience as a black physician. How how has racism affected the way you practice medicine? Just kind of, you know, there's so many different ways that you that I think about answering that question. But I think for me, and it's going to sound very. <laughs> Very, very it's kind of funny initially, but I was thinking about this, this song the other day and how I practice medicine, especially being a black, black man, comes from this song. It's by a well-known Christian rap artist named Lecrae. And it's called, simply called Broke. That's it. And he, in that song, he's talking about how having a lack of resources, having things that he would have liked to have had that he doesn't have. 
how it made him realize that he has to push harder and push stronger and kind of get into that mindset where you're seeing things from different angles where had you not had that sort of struggle, maybe you wouldn't have had that same passion and that same drive to go forward. I think that's kind of how I've approached life being a black male physician. It, you know, there's this one example that you may have seen. I, I don't know where it started. It started somewhere on social media. And, in, and, and during the example, what they did is they had people line up on a, they had them line up on a line and they were all together, people from all different way, walks of life, white people, black people, minorities, every, everybody. And based on the question and the way that you answered it, you either took a step forward, stood still, or in some instances took a step mm -hmm. back. And so when, when, they, when they did this, at the end of the uh, questioning, the, which, what you began to notice was there was a huge separation between most of the white people and most of the minorities, with the minorities being in the back and the white people being in the front. Because they would ask questions like, how many of you came from a, a household with a mother and a father? How, much of you, how many of you live, have families that lived above the poverty level? How many of you had access to good school systems? Things of that nature. So I had already kind of understood how this was going to play out when they started, but what, but what was interesting to me was as I was watching this, I began to see something else. While I was standing in the back watching the responses, because we had a moment to share based on where you were on that position, people would kind of talk about um, how they felt based on where they were in the, um, um, on the line, uh, in the field rather, from, from where they started from. People began to personalize where they were. For example, uh, I remember uh, a dear white brother began to feel sorry. He was like, I can't, you know, I'm looking at where I'm at right now. And I, and, and, and it, you know, my, my parents have sacrificed hard, but I feel so bad because I recognize that people don't have, they didn't have resources. And then, and I was at the back and I think people were kind of, they felt somewhat intimidated or somewhat uh, they, they, uncomfortable because I was in the back. Well, how is he going to look? You know, what, is he angry? And from my point of view as a servant of Christ, I totally saw something totally different. You know, being in the back there, I could totally see how a person needs to navigate and move ahead. That, that, that field of view, that perspective has allowed me a certain amount of humility, grace, and understanding about relationships. And that just doesn't apply to medicine. It applies to life, but particularly in medicine, because this is a healthcare ent entity. And knowing how to engage my patients wherever they're at and help them move ahead without being left behind. And so as a black male physician, as a Christian black male physician, which I think is the unique identifier for myself, mm -hmm. it's empowered me and enabled me to build bridges where there may have been roadblocks previously. And it's very difficult. I'm, I, I please don't, I'm not trying to minimize some of the obstacles that we've had and some of the struggles that have been unique to myself being a black male physician. And, but that's a whole, that's a whole different conversation that I, I don't know that we have time for. But I think the more important answer for your question is, I think as a black male Christian physician with Christian being the identifier, there's a unique perspective that I have on life that I wouldn't have had, had I not grown up in the demographic that I did. So I thank God for my situation. However, we know there's a lot of work to be done. Mm. Well, Nicole mentioned in, in the introduction and kind of leading up to this webinar that uh, the death of Ahmaud Arbery was mm. definitely impactful and George Floyd of, of late. And how has it affected you, Amari? And, and what changes would you like to see moving sure. forward? I mean, that's being the catalyst of, of a lot of, of, of this discussion nationally. How, how would you like to see us moving forward? How has it impacted you as well? You know, initially, um, total transparency here, because I think we owe that to our organizations, we owe it to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Initially, Bill, I felt numb. Mm. I felt absolutely nothing. Mm. I didn't. It was another name. It was like almost like there was a ticker in the back of my mind, and I'm like, okay, Trayvon Martin, mm. uh, uh, Philando Castillo. Okay, who is this? Okay, this is another one. Okay, it's Tuesday. That's how I felt, and I, mm. I please forgive me if that sounds, this, if that sounds uh, not, um, humble or um, giving the, um, the seriousness to the situation it is, but I'm just being honest about, honest about how I felt. But then when I started seeing, but I think what was unique was having the, having the situation to where we're dealing with this COVID pandemic, mm -hmm. where there's no, no distractions, there's no NFL, there's no NBA, there's nothing going on. On the heels of Ahmaud, Arbor, uh, uh, Ahmaud Arbery, and then having the whole situation with Floyd happen, 
I think the two together and watching the people get out and speak about this, something began to rise in me that I hadn't felt in a while. And I was so thankful and it was so necessary. And it, it's uh, not, a, not a hatred or anything bitter, but uh, a, a righteous indignation, if you will, that I wanna see some things happen. And it made me realize that I have to use my platform and every person who's listening here has a platform. You don't have to, whether or not you can march downtown or whether or not you have 300 people listening to you on a webinar, it doesn't matter. We all have a sphere of influence because we're all mm -hmm. interconnected, but it made me recognize the importance of my responsibility to my platform, the people who are around me to make sure these issues are being addressed and make sure that we're not just talking about them, but there's mm -hmm. some meaningful interactions on both sides. So that people are so that after these talks are done, we see meaningful change or steps in the right direction. Right. Um, I want to say this one other thing. Um, Bill, you and I, we go, we go back about at least what 10 years or so, something like that. <laughs> and and I and you're one of about five or six other friends who are in my inner circle who I could talk to. I could call you up at any time I want to and say, Bill, I'm dealing with this. My heart, based on what's going on, is that I want to see, I want to see my white brothers and sisters um, take some of the steps that I've seen you take. I want to see some of my white brothers and sisters who are in a position to make some changes happen. I want to see them become passionate, and I want to see them hurt because they know me just like you know me. They recognize that my pain if they really want to understand Christ, if they really want to understand what it means to, to share in the fellowship of his suffering, then we have to learn what it means to love our, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Mm. And that's not easy. That's not easily done. So I'm hoping, and I, and I don't mean to just, I don't mean to single out my white brothers and sisters. I'm, I, it has to happen both ways. I'm just speaking to the people who are in a position of change. And we know from the numbers that overwhelmingly those are white individuals. And so that's what that's where that comment comes from. Well, I think you've touched on a couple of key components that can really uh, help uh, move us forward in this uh, this uh, process of reconciliation. Is is awareness a big part of the discussion we're having and, and really talking honestly and openly with one another, as well as relationship. Um, you know, change and and opportunities for reconciliation reconciliation that is happen. When there's incarnation, it's it's when people Absolutely. are in each other's lives, and uh, and I have appreciated our friendship over the years, and we've walked through some some great yeah. opportunities, and as well as some tough tough spots yes. too together. Yes. So, yes. Um, so there's a real aspiration to see a movement here, but there are real obstacles too, Amar. Let's yeah. not, let's not sugarcoat this. I mean, what do you perceive are some of the largest mm -hmm. obstacles in that we're facing that 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 uh, especially within the disparity, you know, the uh, disparities within healthcare. I mean, that's sure. that's what we're really focused on a lot during our discussion. What, what do you see as some of those obstacles? I think I think I think it's it's the same situation that you see in a poll. Everybody agrees that racism exists within the poll. My wife said hello, so I gotta say hello to my wife. Stop mid sentence. I don't care. <laughs> hey, babe, thank you for being here. Okay, um, <laughs> um, but the poll spoke to it. You know, it's like. Everybody knows racism exists, even mm. within healthcare. Mm. But when asked, do you think that it affects the way you practice medicine? Mm. About 25% said yes, another 25% said no, and the other was, I think the rest were sometimes, or, you know. I think what we need to do is, the first thing is we need to convince people, yes, it exists, and not just on a journal article level. I'm not just speaking scholastically right now. I'm speaking to, if you're listening to my voice, I'm talking to the way you practice medicine in yourself. I'm speaking to myself as well. I mean, we all are affected by, by racism and it, and it, and it affects our, the core of our very being. So to think that it wouldn't affect that the way we pr practice medicine would be disingenuous. There's a book that I love called Culture Map by Erin Meyer. And in this book, she tells this joke. And I think it really gets to the point of what I'm talking about. There's these two fish that are coming. And the book, by the way, the book has nothing to do with racism. Mm -hmm. But if you read the book through the filter of racism, it has everything to do with it. But anyway, there's these two fish um, coming in the water and they're talking to each other and they're discussing their day. And this one larger fish is coming from the other direction. And he looks at the two smaller fish and he says, hey guys, what's the water like? The two fish look at him and they're puzzled. And as he's 
as, as the older fish are swimming by, you can hear them mumbling. They say, what, what's water? Mm. And it really helps you to understand that mm. unless you have a filter or a frame of reference, you can't see what's right in front of your face because it hasn't touched you in a way that has opened your eyes. I love that movie, The Matrix. Sometimes we have to unplug from The Matrix to understand that what the world that we've been living in, is not the same reality that a lot of other people are living. So I think the first aspect is just convincing people that it happens on an everyday basis. And I would dare say that it probably happens within your office. And sometimes you're probably the perpetrator and you don't even realize it. And that's a tougher conversation to get people to believe. So convincing them is number one. The second one is developing needed relationships. When you think about affirmative action, affirmative action takes that very, that very step. It's saying, I'm going to legislate and mandate that you have a certain person of a certain ethnicity within this office or within this world. What are they really doing? They're saying, we think that you need relationships outside of the ones that you have to effectively manage the organization and get to a place that we know as a society is better overall. However, just like everything else, you really don't, you really can't do a good job when you're legislating morality. Right. What I want to see happen, what really needs to happen, one of the obstacles that are hard to overcome is people have to understand that these relationships, they have to look like the relationships that we're talking about are with people who look like, think like, and have nothing very have nothing to do with the way that you look and the way that you feel. So, for example, like Bill and I, when we talk about our lives and the, the backgrounds that we came from, total contrast. I mean, it, sometimes I hear you speaking the things that you say, and I have to I have. It takes me a second to catch up. I'm like, oh, okay, I got it. That was that's how, okay. Now I see he said that because he grew up like this, and this is what he did. But if I hadn't had this type of relationship. And if my frame of reference was all the same, it's kind of like flying at 30,000 feet. You don't know what speed you're going at. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have no clue. It's when you get closer to the ground that you realize, oh, wow, I'm going pretty fast. And that's what it's like with relationships. You don't understand whether or not you're healthy, whether or not you're uh, culturally and socially going in a direction of eliminating racism and moving that obstacle, unless you have relationships around you that look nothing like you. Mm. Thank you. That's a great exhortation and a reminder. And we're going to have to stop here with our conversation, um, sure. although we're going to have you back for the Q&A. And let me also ask, you've heard Amari uh, mention some things. Perhaps there's some questions that you all have, uh, those of you who are attending. Uh, don't forget in the Q&A um, function that that's your opportunity to ask those questions. We're going to be taking those throughout our webinar. And then at the end, we're going to have a chance to uh, present those before our panelists. So uh, thank you, Amari. You're welcome. And I'm going to hand it over to Nicole that's going to uh, take us to, into our next interview. Thank you, Bill. And thank you, Amari. Great uh, points you made there. So I'm delighted to uh, share with you all and hear uh, from our next guest, uh, Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford. As I mentioned to you earlier, Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford practices and teaches at Massachusetts General Hospital, Harvard Medical School, as one of the first fellowship trained obesity medicine physicians in the world. And we're going to be talking a little bit uh, for about the next uh, 12, 13 minutes about uh, obesity and also racism and how racism acts as a social determinant of health uh, and how it also impacts. Uh, inflammation in our body. So Fatima, welcome. And again, thank you for joining us today. I know you're busy and, and saving lives and helping us live a better quality of life. So thank well, you. thanks for having me. I really appreciate being here. Well, no, and it was like I said, you and I met uh, earlier this year, and I'm so glad that now we've had an opportunity to really connect on, on a project here. So thank you. Absolutely. So what I want to ask you first is, uh, what are examples of social determinants of health and how does racism factor as a social determinant of health? You know, I, I, I get a little bit um, taken aback when we talk about this as a social determinant of health because racism is something that we don't really have to have, right? It's a learned behavior mm -hmm. um, and it's learned from early. So we, you know, you don't, you're not born into this world with this idea or concept of, of being racist, where both um, whether it's implicit, right, which is that racism that we don't know exists within us, you know, or explicit, that racism that we know that we have towards individuals. And so, you know, I, I push back a smidge um, with regards to that, because I think that this is a learned behavior that obviously del is deleterious impact on our health. 
Um, and so I think we have to be thoughtful about that. But when we think about racism, we do have to think about its impact. So in health and, and as a scientist, I always think about what is science proven, right? Because that's what I have to, to convey um, as a researcher. So what we do know is if we look at something like the Jackson Health Study, um, which was performed in Jackson, Mississippi, I'm actually born and raised in Atlanta, so close to, you know, kind of in that general region of the country. Um, this, they actually looked at racism within the Jackson Health Study and tried to discern whether or not that actually pretended to worse health outcomes. And what they found was that people that experienced racism and all the people felt like they experienced racism, but actually internalized whatever that racism that they experienced had higher levels of inflammation. And from for all of my doctors here, when we're talking about inflammation, we're looking at certain um, key, um, I guess tenants, we're looking at CRP, which is C-reactive protein, cortisol, IL-1, which is an interleukin-1, IL-6, TNL alpha, which is tumor necrosis for factor alpha, all of these markers were more elevated in these individuals. When you have higher levels of stress as indicated by these markers, like I just mentioned, you actually store more adipose tissue or store more fat. Um, yeah. That is a mechanism to defend your body um, because if you look at us over, the, our, over our time as existence as humans, one of the things that we did to really kind of prepare ourselves for what we could, was like a bad time coming, which was typically a famine, was we stored adipose tissue, we stored fat. Um, and so in the context of being subjected daily or mm -hmm. weekly or whatever it might be to stressors that are often associated with racism, whether it be explicit or implicit, you can imagine why we disproportionately see um, higher levels of obesity within communities of color, particularly with the group most disproportionately impacted, um, non-Hispanic Blacks, and specifically non-Hispanic Black women or African-American women. Um, we know that the rates are almost 60% with regards to obesity within the Black um, um, female community. But if we're looking at it, we're looking at, you know, that this is something that's pervasive in both Black men and in Black women. Um, and so I think that hopefully that paints kind of the picture if we're thinking about how these interact together. And as we're thinking about, you know, things like, for example, COVID and the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color, particularly black and brown communities, we have to think about these chronic stressors and how they impact the um, outcomes that we've been seeing around this country with COVID-19. Great explanation, Fatima, because I, yeah, that makes complete sense when you take us back to the reasons why our body stored fat and what, you know, now, how that's being done uh, in an adverse, in an adverse and a mm -hmm. certainly detrimental fashion. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for explaining that. Uh, in a previous interview, you said that we are more connected than we want to believe and that we're more similar than we would want to believe. Mm -hmm. We're all connected because we are created in the image of God. Mm -hmm. So how is such connectivity disrupted when healthcare delivery is inequitable? So I think the fact that we, and I, you know, listening to Dr. Hodge a little bit earlier, and I'm sure, you know, subsequent uh, presenters, even in our Q&A, the fact that we would disproportionately treat someone mm -hmm. um, in one way in healthcare or in any facet of life, just because of the color of their skin, recognizing that our, our DNA is like basically the same, you know, we're 99% the same DNA of mm. non-human primates, particularly yeah. chimpanzees. So if we have 99% the same DNA of, of non-human primates, you can imagine how as humans, there's just a few little, small little things in the genome that really make us different. So as a person now, of course, I'm coming from a, a marginalized community as a black woman who happens to be a black physician, despite the fact that I'm at Harvard or wherever I am, I'm still viewed first as a black woman. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I would deliver care differently to someone because of their race, particularly, um, is, is disturbing. But often as a physician, as black physicians, we often face significant encounters, even from patients. And the issue that I was dealing with directly before this call, um, which delayed my getting on to our kind of our pre-call for you guys didn't see that, um, was that a patient specifically said, well, as a black woman, you should be ashamed of yourself. But first of all, she was accusing me of something that wasn't right, but called out my race in that context. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if, the, the, if this, the situation had been the same, if she would have specifically pointed out, well, as a white man, you should be you know, ashamed of yourself. Or as a white woman, you should be ashamed. And so 
I shouldn't have been ashamed anyway, because <laughs> she was, you know, um, conjuring up something that was not um, indeed true. But the whole prop, the issue is, is that there is this concept of privilege such that you begin to then make me seem less than. I thankfully know that I was created in the image of God and thankfully that you guys created this. And so I don't pay attention to that narrative that you want me to pay in or play attention to, which then denigrates my ability to be who I am mm -hmm. and follow God's will for my life. Mm -hmm. So, um, but that's, that's not an uncommon phenomenon at yeah. all. It is something that is pervasive. It's something that um, happened to me, a few for you guys that remember that are the, the 332 of you that are watching, I was on a Delta Airlines flight in 2018. And this story made yes. um, the news in 104 countries. Yes. And even though I have four degrees and I'm working on my fifth, I've done two residencies and two fellowships and I have an 102 page CV, you guys can go look online and see that. And had my medical license on me, I was asked repeatedly if I was actually a doctor and whether or not the medical license was actually mine with my actual name present. So here I am following the rules, whatever those rules are to yeah. assimilate with what society tells me I'm supposed to do to be of X stature. And despite checking, dotting the I's, crossing the T's, checking the boxes, I'm still perceived to be less than who I am. And you can imagine that as a, as a physician and or as a patient, when that person approaches you in the room, how do I treat them? Do I give them the same level of respect, right. attention to detail right. with regards to their care, understanding of what their daily life experiences are and how that affects their overall health? I think those are really important issues that we have to be mindful of. On point, and, and Fatima, uh, yeah, 102 page, but uh, v, uh, CV, I mean, all in the degrees, absolutely. There are credit, our credentials do not seem to matter, nor our confidence. I'll be honest with you. I worked at a, uh, a large international public firm and uh, the fact that I was, um, I came into the room as an intern, but very confident in, in my speaking and my, uh, what I delivered for the, for the work. And they were like, they misconstrued my confidence as arrogance. And I'm thinking, yes. I'm simply doing my job in the, in the, in the, created in the image that, I, that God has created me to do with, with the giftings he's given me and how that was basically everyone in that room was called to a level of excellence and me operating in a level of excellence was considered to be arrogant. And oh, absolutely. I, I get, I face that all the time here for my colleagues. Well, if you yeah, happen sure. to be, yeah, um, <laughs> came to my aid and said, yeah. you know, she's she doing her job. <laughs> right. No, I, and I think that yeah. we, we always are um, tempering, you know, whether or not you know, we can't show like all of who we are because then that will seem too domineering, especially as a black woman, you know, what, what is this? And I don't think other people sit and have to like every day calculate what they're doing to do the role that they've already been placed there to do um, yeah. so that it doesn't offend someone else. You know, the thing is to do and deliver the best level of care. Um, that's what I think in terms of the work that I do, you know, both here in the US and around the world. I. I care about the person reaching their happiest, healthiest self yeah. and whatever I can do to make that happen, whatever tools that I've acquired along the way, whatever knowledge or education that I've been um, entrusted with, I'm going to do that. And anytime that you want to question who I am or my value or worth as a provider, as a healthcare provider who happens to be a physician, that is problematic and it then, denigrates like that level of care that we talked about. Exactly. Well, we're going to soon transition to our next guest, uh, but I want to say if one minute, can you offer us what you would want to see policy or what, or what you want to see to ensure that everyone has the opportunity of, to receive a quality of life in their care? I think that every major medical organization, every major um, healthcare supporting agency really needs to do a deep dive to look at what they're doing internally and how they can better collaborate with external collaborators. If you're seeing that disproportionately the makeup of your um, healthcare organization does not represent the population that you serve, mm -hmm. or that you have persons that might represent that population, but somehow they're always at lower positions or less paid, less promoted, yes. Um, yes. those things pay, have play a large role in how the, the community is seen. So if, if you come to a hospital and you see no doctors or that look like you and you feel as though no one understands you, 
then you're not going to get the level of care. That connection, that physician-patient connection will indeed suffer. This is not to say that persons that are not from minority communities can't deliver care to minority populations. It just right. means that if there is not a connection made on a very personal level to really understand what my daily plight is, then we're going to continue to suffer. So we need to look at that from a structural level to deal with this idea or concept of structural racism in our large organizations and get down and grind down to what's happening on the ground. Because if we talk about these things, but don't address it within our own organizations, we're going to continue to see this propagate time and time again. And that's what we've been seeing. So that would be my response. I would agree. It's, it's a, about the culture and, and right. having an intention. So right. Tima, thank you so much. Thank you. Know, you. Back to you during our audience Q and A. Okay, Bill? excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Fatima, for that great discussion. And uh, we're going to ask uh, Tara and Ryan Frakes to join us on camera here. We've got this young couple. Uh, you let's make sure we have. There you are. I can see you now. Uh, fantastic. Thanks for joining us and being a part of this conversation. Um, in, your, in our introduction, uh, we mentioned that you have adopted uh, two uh, African-American sons, uh, the ages five and six, is that correct? Yes, That's correct. Okay. Well, we wanted you to be uh, part of this conversation because we wanted to kind of uh, draw out kind of some of the challenges and the dynamics that you have uh, faced uh, raising black sons as white parents in this day and age. And, and Tara, you're a physician and Brian, you're an educator, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, talk a little bit about uh, how you are parenting your sons given the current climate we face. Oh, um, I think one of the main themes for us, uh, even from day one when we started this journey, is that we wanted to be intentional. Mm. I think that's a theme in our marriage, but it's become even more important as we try and raise our sons. Um, Obviously, being a mixed race family, that adds some challenges, and we can't completely identify with our brothers and sisters who are uh, black or brown and raising their children. And so we are just um, trying to put resources and people in place that can support us, that can educate us. We're trying to learn as much as we can um, exhaustively at times uh, so that we're prepared to provide our kids with the best opportunities that we can. Uh, obviously, I would assume uh, you, your boys have experienced degrees of racism. You live in a predominantly white uh, uh, community, correct? That is correct. Have you been able to shield them uh, from that? Have you had that conversation? Do they? Is there a sense of awareness like there's something different as they as they interface with uh, other kids their age that aren't black? Are they discovering? Uh, some of the challenges of what it means to be a young uh, black uh, boy in a predominantly white culture, particularly in the community you live in? Yeah, so our, our community is roughly 7% African American. And mm -hmm. um, we realized um, from the start that when you look in our inner circle, our friends, our family, um, growing up in small town Wisconsin, that uh, pretty much uh, everybody that we interact with is white. And uh, as is from when they were young, we realized in the pictures we took and different things that we saw, they were the only ones that stood out as uh, different. And so uh, being intentional and trying to be educated, um, we are still learning and trying to be humble and trying to understand um, what it takes to raise our boys, but our intention is always to try to get outside of our box. And if that means talking to um, our local barber, uh, or you know, we actually go to two barbers so they can have diff two different barbershop experiences with two different types of males in their lives. And when we're in those situations, whoever they might be, we, we humble ourselves and try to learn as much as we can from our black and brown brothers and sisters. Related to race, I use the term shield, and I guess I want to be cautious about that. Mm. We really don't want to shield our kids from this. I think that's one of the biggest struggles we have right now is how do we find this balance between maintaining our kids' innocence? They are only five and six, and yet 
let's be real about the differences. I mean, it's not a mystery that they weren't born biologically to us. And so we've talked about that from pretty much day one. Our oldest has known and talked about his skin color being different since he was three, maybe in part um, because we're not afraid to be open about that, but we also choose a lot of the books that we read mm -hmm. that try and have um, characters that represent him uh, more than us. And we think that's really important to find mirrors and models for him uh, wherever we can. Mm. You know, the, the discussion of white privilege uh, comes up in this topic of uh, race and racism. And um, what have you discovered just for yourself as, as parents now, uh, parents of, of two black boys uh, in terms of the impact uh, of, of white privilege and, the, and the, uh, the relevancy of that in our discussion? Well, white privilege is real. Um, I, I'm 45 years old, I'm white. I'm, I've walked into how many places in my entire life, been pulled over how many times for speeding and I've never been, to my knowledge, a suspect in anyone's mind when they've looked at me. And so that privilege is real and I've, I've had to learn that, I've had to understand that. Um, and, um, and so to, to recognize it first, obviously, is what we're learning and what we're trying to humble ourselves to try to go into situations. Um, and, and then also to humbly and talk to our other white friends and family that that exists. And that, that, is, that is sometimes hard to do. Um, why why is that hard brian um it's uh <laughs> <laughs> i know that's a loaded question but what makes it so difficult I mean, yeah was saying you know it's like you don't know if you don't know yeah. about right. the environment and mm -hmm. um and that's the world we grew up in we grew up in very white communities you know if you mm -hmm. had asked us when we were young I, I always thought adoption was a part of my future and i always thought it would be cross-culture not necessarily mm -hmm. in this way Right. Uh, that I would have African-American boys, but the reality of adoption is a lot of people want white and a lot of people want girls. And so if you're not specifying those things when you're in that uh, selection process, which you can, we just opted not to, um, we weren't totally surprised that we would be raising African-American boys and we, we trust that God has orchestrated this whole process mm -hmm. for us to be their parents in this place in this time. Mm -hmm. I have to say about the white privilege part, and there's actually kind of a funny story related to that, but there's also um, the reality that we know, you know, I've, I've been ashamed of my white privilege for the last several years as I'm becoming more aware of uh, the dynamic in my family. Um, until probably the last year or two, we've been part of some, some groups and some leaders and mentors who have been guiding us who are African Americans. And um, they said, don't be ashamed of that. Now you need to use that for good. And I think that's where we're at right now in our country uh, in some of the dynamics too. Like people are trying to speak up, but it, sometimes it seems if you're a person of color, you're still not being heard. Hmm. So those of us who have white privilege, as much as that power can sometimes be used for terrible, horrific things that we've seen, uh, if we're aware, we have the opportunity to impact substantial change and to take leadership and to begin doing a better job of educating and conversing and, and navigating those um, relationships and dynamics. And as I begin to open up to that idea, I think I have some opportunities here. Mm. Um, and, and we see that as, as part of our role, whether that's just in our smaller uh, spheres of influence or if it's gonna be on a greater level. I mean, to be honest, we are surprised we're here today. <laughs> But God has orchestrated, if you see what's happened in the last eight weeks in our life, it's not an accident. Um, but to end this, the one funny story with white, kind of funny, actually, um, with white privilege is um, our two-year-old son. He accidentally, 7.15 one morning, hit the 911. Uh, well, maybe not accidentally, but he didn't really know. Uh, 911 button on my husband's phone. So within, you know, he caught on really quickly what was happening, hung up. But they called right back because, of course, they have to call back. So within two or three minutes, they, we had an officer at our front door, 7.15 on a Tuesday morning. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I just had this sudden realization of how different that would have experienced that experience would have been had we not been white parents in an affluent neighborhood. Hmm. Had they showed up at a different house, maybe someone of color, maybe in a different neighborhood. Mm-hmm. I don't think he would have just handed my son a sticker and pat it on the head and said, oh, you're so cute, have a great day. Mm-hmm. And that was a white privilege experience. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're here. We're glad you're a part of this conversation. And, um, and thank you for sharing that. And of course, we'll be inviting you back to talk uh, about some of the uh, you know, at least address and, and speak into some of the questions that we have teed up. And we were beginning to accumulate quite a bit of great questions. And so we look forward to hearing from you all both again, as we do the Q&A section. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Nicole and uh, Rick as they uh, as we have our last interview for our time together. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And thank you to the Frakes, to Brian and Tara. My goodness. Rick, hi, how are you doing? Good. Thank you. How are you, Nicole? I'm good and so good to have you here with us and uh, learn more about your work in serving with thy minority communities in inner city Memphis for the past 30 years as you have. Uh, you were raised in New, uh, grew up in New Orleans and uh, made your way to LSU and you were part of our LSU CMBA chapter uh, during, your, under, during your time there. So wonderful to learn your CMBA ties and then uh, and then God has placed you in this work uh, to work with African Americans who are low income to provide health care. And I want to know what what inspired you to go into this kind of work so we can share in the next 10 minutes what inspired you to go into this work and um, and then also why were you opposed to doing uh, traditional outpatient clinic work and rather than what you're doing now? Yeah, well, thank you. Um, mm-hmm. I think uh, the probably the biggest factors for the career moves that we made, my wife and I and our family, uh, have to do with our upbringing. Um, if I was in that exercise with Amari, I had a lot of the benefits. Uh, my parents are still married after 56 years. And I had great public education, went to private university. But I had a very dramatic conversion uh, to Protestant Christianity in late in high school. And I had the benefit of being reared as a as a Catholic, uh, and there's lots of, in Catholicism, I think probably a stronger vein in Catholicism about concern for the poor. I was influenced by people like Keith Green. Uh, I read a book called Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger by Ron Sider. I was influenced by Campus Crusade. Um, And so I knew early on that if I was going to be a physician, God was going to get me through that. I, I would wanted to be someone who was trying to use those gifts and talents for the poor. And I think most of us Christian uh, people in healthcare, I hope, really meant it when they wrote that essay that we all wrote to a dean that said that we loved humanity and we wanted to relieve suffering and that we hope to use the gifts and talents that God gave us to serve the needy. Uh, I think from that, it was just stumbling obedience. I've, I've had the really great benefit of being around a lot of other super Christian people uh, who had commitments to, to serving the poor and so we just took one step at a time. That CMDA group that I was part of in, I guess, in 1986, uh, four of us from that group made a, a blood pack with each other. We joked that we would kill each other if we bailed out on it, but we were going to work together. We were going to work among the needy. And so in 1995, after struggling, we uh, we opened a health center in Memphis, which is where I came from New Orleans to be a resident, where my, my partners moved to. And um, over... I wish it was 30 years. It's been 30 years since I graduated from medical school, okay. but it's, it's been more like 25 years. Primarily, we have worked uh, among low-income people in our city. And uh, over the last 17 years, my family and I have lived in a, a low-income African-American community here where we opened our second health center, probably opened that in like 1998. If I could, um, I sent you a picture, a slide that um, really I think would be helpful to um, if we could get that on the screen now. This, this is a picture that I frequently use. It's a map and it's done by a guy named Eric Fisher. Eric Fisher has done a map like this for almost every uh, US city. And Eric Fisher cares only about one thing and that's race. So every dot that you see uh, in this map, the blue dots are 25 black people and the red dots are 25 white people. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a smattering of yellow dots. If you look at that middle, those are Latinos. Um, so 
th this map, if you look on the left, that's the Mississippi River in gray. So the Arkansas, uh, the border with Arkansas happens when you cross. And at the bottom is Mississippi. Memphis is located kind of at the intersection of those three states. But the, the thing that is important to see is that in Memphis and in every major city, every major city, um, white people and black people or minorities in general uh, do not live or ethnic groups in general don't live together. And all of the things, Nicole, that you mentioned earlier in your introduction about educational achievement and uh, employment and housing and uh, all of the criminal justice system, they all break down along the lines that you see here. And so mm -hmm. specifically in regard to healthcare, uh, when we started our work in Memphis in the 90s, almost all, and it's still true, unfortunately, almost all the health resources for our county are concentrated in the areas where you see red in this map. And so it happens that we have enough physicians and other healthcare workers, dentists for, for Shelby County, for Memphis. Memphis is 650,000 or so people, 64% African-American within the city limits. The metropolitan area is significantly larger, but we have enough doctors, we have enough physicians and dentists, but they're almost entirely concentrated in the red area. And so we've said for years, that where you see red, doctors are competing with doctors hoping to get patients, and where you see blue, patients have to compete with patients hoping to see doctors. Mm -hmm. And that reality exists in every U.S. city, and the healthcare disparities that we've been hearing about and we've learned about um, exist along racial lines. I wish it was just socioeconomic lines, but it's not. It's primarily along racial lines. So the the thing that I struggle to try to communicate to my own community, at least the community that I came from, is that the reality that we see in this map and the injustice that is that exists really are the, the outcome of an aggregate of a million little decisions. I mean, the reason, primary reason that there are more health facility, or, or resources in the red part of my city and your city isn't because people are rabidly racist and don't want to care for black people, uh, probably. I hope that's not the case, but it's because that's where the opportunities for making money are. Mm. And so over the years and decades and hundreds of years, frankly, the decisions that people who have power and have opportunities in the city, in our city and in our country have made, have been made seemingly for really good reasons. I want my family to be safe in a good mm. community. I want, I want to be in a place where there are good schools. Mm -hmm. I want access to healthcare and amenities. And the decisions that we've made along those lines, which seem right and even seem Christian, if we're, if we're unaware, we don't realize that we're complicit in harming other people in our community. And it, it's actually ironically happened at times, most dramatically when we're trying to do good things for the, the needy people in our, our city, like my city in New Orleans and in Memphis, the changes in our education system happened when the government tried to segregate the schools and provide better educational opportunities for African Americans. And that led to an exodus from the city school system and the creation of an alternative school system that functions very well for people who can afford it and who can live in those communities. And it left the school system in the areas where you see blue in my city struggling. And the same is true with health resources. There are probably, there's probably a risk, honestly, in the red part of my city that people who have resources will get too much health care, if you can imagine. We have a joke, there's a there's a street in East Memphis called Wolf River Boulevard where all of the, or many of the cardiology groups, and orthopedic groups are located in a, in a very um, affluent part of our community. And the joke is that if you're driving down there, you better roll up your window or you might get a heart stent put in. If oh you're not so I hope somebody thinks that's funny. The alternative is in the blue areas, people struggle for the most basic issues for healthcare. So what we started to do with lots and lots of uh, really great people and in Memphis and some of those people have moved to other cities is to be the incarnation. One of our members talked about incarnation. I think Amari talked about like living in a situation where we're the minority, where we send our kids to schools where they are the 7%. Mm -hmm. that maybe don't have the statistics that people would ideally look at for their families. But like, that's a way to have relationships, um, to, to make choices about what we do with our 
training and to deploy those those gifts and talents that God gave us. I mean, this doesn't make sense for people who aren't disciples of Jesus. If you're right. not a disciple of Jesus, you should try to get the most good for yourself and your family. But right. people in the kingdom of God demand equity and justice. And so yes. that's what we've been working towards. And wonderful work it is. Like you said, it's been 25 years that you've been serving in that community. And you've also worked to uh, encourage other Christian healthcare professionals to join you in that work. And you've had some resistance, as you shared earlier, that um, you had some resistance in that work. And I want to, we'll talk more about that later. I know we need to transition uh, shortly to our audience Q&A uh, here in a moment. But uh, you did say something when I, you and I talked earlier, and that is uh, there is too much distance between the rich and the poor. There are generational patterns of poverty and loss that includes lack of opportunities because the majority culture has been protecting and building their own world. And they think the poor is not taking advantage of opportunities, but it's just not that simple. So there is that misnomer and that misconception that um, that people just have been taking advantage of opportunities that they're lazy or not. There are things actually, barriers and things that have been in place that prevent some other um, advancement. Yes. Yeah, I, I wish it were that simple. Uh, this is so complicated. It's so hard to tease it out. But there, there's if you don't know people different than yourself, and this has been said earlier, if you don't understand the obstacles and the place from which they come, uh, it's mm -hmm. very easy to assume that they had every opportunity that you had, that if they would just be like me, if they would just stay in school and they would just work harder and they would mm -hmm. stay married, whatever the notion is, um, that the high school, there, there are some high schools in my community, they're working hard to educate kids, but they don't have a lot of advanced placement classes and opportunities that my kids got uh, when we sent them off for better training for the high school level. Um, so it's just, it's not a fair playing field. And I'm afraid the only way that's ever going to become clear to people who are outside is to find some way to have real meaningful interaction with people who have a yeah. different life than they do. Well said. Rick, thank you so much. And uh, we'll be soon transitioning to our, our audience question and answer. And I'll transition now to Bill. Rick, again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Rick. Um, actually, Rick and the uh, rest of the panelists, I'm going to ask you to uh, open up your cameras and uh, make your mics hot because we are going to have our Q&A time. And uh, we've... Uh, We've got quite a bit of questions. So we have, we're gonna make good use of our last moments here for the webinar. And I'd like to start, I'm gonna direct this towards one of you to start, but I, I would invite you to all contribute or, or any, any of you that feel the need to contribute to a particular answer. Uh, yeah, I love this to be a discussion amongst you all. So I'm gonna start with Amy's question, which I think is a question we'd all expect to hear. And this is, uh, can you provide some practical recommendations for us to stand against racism in healthcare and in our communities? I, I know there's a, there's a real need and desire for something practical we can kind of put, you know, put our hands to. So let me start with you, Amari. Let me have you tee it up and then uh, invite uh, many of you uh, other panelists to contribute. But Amari, how would you answer Amy's question about providing practical re re recommendations to stand against racism in healthcare. Yeah, you know that's a that's a great question, and for, and that's going to be answered differently for different people, and and that doesn't just have to do with the color of the skin, but really has to do with the station and, in life that you might find yourself in. Um, for example, um, I, I like to use extremes because I think after you use the extremes, it's easy to find your way through. If you're in um, I'm going to take a risk here. If you're in Montana, it's going to be very difficult for you to find a multicultural or an African American community to go serve within the area that's proximate, within an approximate area to where you are. Mm -hmm. So, thinking about extremes like that, what if you don't have things near you? The, the beautiful news is the way you start, I think, is the same for everything. If you consider yourself a Christian first, um, and you may not, and, and if and if you don't, I don't know that my answer will make any sense to you. And I would, I would ask you to probably look at other resources. So I'm going to come from a Christian perspective. I think the first thing you have to do is pray about it. 
And why that might sound, that, that sounds very cliche-ish. And I know people will say, well, we've been praying forever. Well, I, I think maybe we've been praying, but I think you might have been praying the wrong prayers. I think if you actually ask God to give you ideas about what you can do and what's specific to you, I think that's the very first step that you have to do and be sincere about your efforts. Because a lot of times I find that people say that they want change, but they don't. But once you've cleared that hurdle with prayer and you're sincere about the change that you want to see, I think it's a, a, a matter of finding out what's available to you. Now, one thing that's available to everybody is you can read. I mean, if you can't get around a community, if you can't get around a, a group of people who look different than you, the first step that you can start with is find some sources, some resources, some books, some studies, anything. Find something that really interests you and keep reading. Get yourself well-versed in the topics, knowledgeable about what's going on so that when the opportunities do present themselves, you already have that background. And it also lets people know that, hey, this person is very serious. The next thing outside of reading is the relationships. And that may be difficult. I don't know that everybody can develop relationships based on where you're at. But I'd say most of the major cities I like to joke with my friend like this. If, <laughs> if you're at a church in, in Atlanta, uh, Atlanta area, and you want a multicultural experience and you don't see it, you might be in the wrong church because <laughs> there's no reason that that can't exist. It's going to take some tough decisions. You might have to look at things and the way you've done things in the past and do something total, totally countercultural. I can't tell you how many times I've taken my, my black family in an all white church and walked down the aisles to our seats with everybody looking at us. And I'm like, kids, Hey, this, we, we have to do it. It's necessary. They need to see us. They need to recognize that we're believers too. And we want relationship with these people as well as, as well as we want them to have relationships with people who look like us. So the change starts with us. So I think those are very, those are the first real tangible steps you can take. Prayer, uh, uh, relationships, and then making some stances and doing some things that are maybe outside of your comfort zones to make it happen. I can't answer that for each and every individual, but I think every individual can answer that based off some of the things that I've said. Anybody else like to? Yeah, so I, I actually would give a very tangible step that I think that everyone on this that's listening to this call should potentially do. Um, so Harvard has what's called an IAT or the Harvard Implicit Association Test. And they have it for different issues, but they have one particularly for race. And you take the IAT and you discern whether or not you indeed have either implicit or explicit bias, i.e. racism. Um, people are often astonished by their results. It is something that we do require all the Harvard medical students to do during their time here. And they are often taken aback by their own results. Um, so I think that you know, change starts with self. And if we think about um, the Bible, right? Um, it said Luke, who's the physician, heal thyself first, right? So mm -hmm. on this call, we have to think about what we are doing and what we actually think. A lot of people, well, no, I'm not. I'm not, you know, and do you, are you sure? You don't know. Let's, why, why not use a, a metric or tool that's been validated to discern whether or not you indeed have these issues. And then when you work with these issues with yourself, you begin to work with your children and or your families, and then that permeates into the world. So I would say that's a very, um, uh, an easy thing to go do. It's not going to take, it's not laborious, it's free. So you don't have, there's no paywall to access it. So it's the Harvard IAT, the Harvard Implicit Association Test for race, particularly. And I think that everyone that is within listening um, viewpoints of where I am right now, if you can just take that test and just discern for yourself what things you need to work on first. So that would be my response. Fantastic. Thank you. Fatima, okay, any, we have, yeah, we have a ahead. question from Barbarella that, that asks, how do we change the devaluing of lives in the practice of medicine and healthcare when it comes to race, sexual orientation, and socioeconomic status? Who would like to pick that one up? I'll start since I just finished and I'm fired up. I've been fired up all day because I've been on calls. <laughs> no idea, you guys. You guys are getting just like a piece of what's going on this whole day. Okay. You know, I, I think like, think of how you want to be treated, right? If you are indeed yourself not treating the person that you're seeing in the same way that you want to be treated if the tables were turned, then you're not doing it well enough, right? We often treat ourselves, we, we wanna treat ourselves well, right? Because we value ourselves, we value our lives, we value our upbringing, whatever it might be. But if we are not treating those people in the way that we would want to be treated, if the tables are turned, regardless of those different um, things that are put out, gender, race, socioeconomic status, LGBTQ status, et cetera, 
then you are doing it all wrong. Reevaluate yourself, look internally, fix yourself. Then you can then approach and fix this large systemic issue that we have. So that's my brief, but obviously very passionate response. Love it, thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I certainly agree. Um, speaking only for myself, that transformed heart that I have to have, I'm gonna love people the way I love myself. Um, it's a miracle that only the Holy Spirit can accomplish. And it has to happen yeah. again. I think it's only possible for Christian people. Like, I think the work that we're calling people to do isn't going to be fueled by people being grateful or thankful or for us transforming healthcare in a year or 10 years. Like this is kingdom of God work. And it's only going to happen if our hearts are transformed by the resurrection power of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And that has to happen day by day. Absolutely. You have so many questions, Bill. You want to go to the next two, Rick? Well, um, I'm going to touch on uh, a hot button one. Uh, hopefully this doesn't uh, create a lot of landmines, but it is the one that was upvoted the most. So I think I would be a okay. malpractice if I ignored it. But KG raises the question, and I, I would like to reframe it because it is a it has a political connotation with um, our president and and invoking and using the Bible as a prop for a um, as he addressed uh, the issue of racism the other day and but I'd like to take it out of that context and and talk about it in more of a general sense in terms of this the Bible itself um, and Rick I'm going to let you start off with this question but how does the Bible inform how we address racism I mean we are Christ followers in this conversation and so. And, and I should say, too, uh, you know, we can say as Christ followers, we should have a better record in, on this issue. But unfortunately, historically, the church has been uh, complicit in, in, in not effectively addressing this issue. So how do we as Christ followers um, apply and allow the Bible to inform how we see this issue and, and address it? Yeah. It's a great question. I think, and unless I'm mistaken, the first crisis of the new church in the book of Acts is was based on race, like the Jewish widows are being overlooked by, I'm sorry, the um, Greek background widows are being overlooked by, um, and, and the Hebrew widows are being fed. And there's repeated references in the Pauline epistles to the differences between Jews and Gentiles. And this was a enmity that would not allow people even to eat together, to sit down together. The conversation that the woman at the well has with Jesus demonstrates like, how is it you're even talking to me, she said. So mm -hmm. like Christianity is so radical that it took that ancient world and said, uh, there is no difference between Jew or Gentile, Greek or free, Scythian, like there's nothing here. Jesus Christ reunifies all of humanity by his becoming human and dying and bleeding, being resurrected in power. And the gospel isn't just for Jews anymore. It's for every tribe, tongue, and nation. And every bit of it is going to happen forever. Uh, there, there really are no differences fundamentally, genetically, has been said earlier, or spiritually when it comes to the redemptive power of Jesus Christ. And so that's got to be our point of view. And anything otherwise is ridiculous. And the church has got to speak out truthfully about that. Um, I'd love to respond also. I think that we have to be um, conscious of how the Bible can be used for our own agendas. And what we do know is that if we look at the 400 years of slavery that Nicole mentioned earlier, is that the Bible was used to justify slavery for many years. That comes from Ephesians, where it says, slaves be obedient to your human masters with fear and trembling. Now, when we think about the Bible and when it was written, it's taken in the context of what was going on in that time, right? This was written by actual humans, not about some mythical features or, you know, gods that exist. This was written and steeped in the culture of that time. So we have to recognize the culture with where, where we are now and think about how the language that's in the Bible can be used in perverted ways. And we can say that, you know, some of the political um, persons, now I don't like to speak on who they are, um, maybe using this to um, embrace their own agenda. But this is exactly how slavery um, was manifest here in this country and was perpetuated for so long. So I think that we have to be mindful that we can really twist in any way if we are not following the Holy Spirit and using the language in a way 
is just self-serving as opposed to reflecting what Christ would want for our lives. And so I think that those are important things for us to capture about the language of the Bible, the culture in which it was steeped, and how it can be perverted to um, accomplish self-serving goals. Um, I Well, uh, Fatima and Rick, thank you. Those are awesome. And I just want to piggyback off of that and say, you know, one of the things that I've been very intentional about doing, and I think that it's time for the church to start doing, and I can't, but I mean, I just look at my Facebook post, and it is amazing how one post will be totally to the left, one post will be totally to the right, and there's no middle ground. Everything is so polarized, and I think one of the things that we have to learn about, if you're going to reach people, you have to sometimes um, put yourself in a position that's very uncomfortable, and I think the most... I think that position for most of us nowadays needs to just be mute. I, I wish a lot of, I think a lot more of our Christian brothers and sisters need to mute your opinions. As a matter of fact, a good litmus test to tell yourself whether or not your opinions are really relevant, the things that you're posting online, ask yourself, have you ever talked to somebody of that group whom you're talking about in person? If you haven't, don't post it because it takes skill and work. When you think about, think about this. So we're talking about Jesus Christ, right? The great high priest. He can feel the infirmities of the people whom he represents. He left heaven, y'all. He left a kingdom that we have no idea. No eye has seen, no man has heard what God has prepared for him. Took, took this sinful flesh incarnate, walked among us, and didn't stop there, went to a death on a cross. So you want to talk about taking yourself from a position of influence from a position of power, humbling yourself to being nothing. And, and here's the key thing that people forget. He didn't start his ministry until he was 30 years old. Yes. yes. So he spent 30 years just learning and understanding and walking in this skin, mm -hmm. which is not his natural origin. We have people who spend 30 minutes and want to go out and post epic rants on Facebook and Twitter and have signs in your yard. If you want to draw people to Christ, Christ, remove your political signs from your yards. It has nothing to do with that. Yeah. If you want to go into politics, go get a job in Washington. But if you're in the business of reconciliation, particularly within healthcare, where we have a responsibility to patients who look nothing like us, some of them talk with heavy accents. Some people have scents that might sound, might smell unsavory to you or things that you don't like, whatever. If you want to get past all of that, you have to decrease. You have to get out of the way and I'm going to tell you something, guys, that is a lot easier said than done. That takes work. To remove and die to yourself takes work. Uh, brother, Dr. Hodge, you said everything. You said it all right there. Absolutely. Decrease uh, self so Christ can increase. Absolutely. We may have time for one more or two more questions. I want to take a question here from Karen, who says, uh, Working among high a high volume of African-American patients, and it has been painful to see how COVID-19 has hit them and their families. One of the key issues I have seen is that there are undiagnosed comorbidities, making it difficult to manage their, their system, systemic inflammatory response syndrome and COVID-19. What can we do to ensure that access to primary care and management of chronic diseases is encouraged among African-American families? What are the co most common deterrents to seeking preventive care, meaning financial or cultural? So helping families who are dealing with COVID-19 in the African-American community, how can we, and they have undiagnosed comorbidities. Anyone want to take that on? Well, I mean, I guess I'll, I, I can answer those questions. So I'll just start talking. Um, so I think that one of the key things that we have to think about is the distrust in, in the Black community um, with traditionally physicians. Um, when we look at the number of physicians, for example, of Black men has actually been steadily declining since the 1970s, which is appalling if you really think about it. Um, the, the sheer number of, of, patients, of physicians that, that are actually of African descent where we could maybe potentially have some trust um, is just overall very low. So what we do need to know is that 
persons from all communities who are serving in this covenant role of physician need to be amenable to addressing the needs of the community, much like Dr. Donlin is doing in his work. Mm -hmm. um, with that being said, we are going to be using, utilizing more telemedicine. Telemedicine will be um, how we access much of our care. This will allow a little bit of um, more um, ease, right? Because if you're delivering it from your home to your physician, it's not as intimidating as going into a healthcare setting that's unfamiliar. Um, but the problem that I'm finding when I'm conducting, and I've conducted my patient visits exclusively via telemedicine since March 16th, um, as you may or may not know, Massachusetts was one of the hardest hit states and we are not really back open, mm -hmm. um, although the recent protests may not appear to indicate that. Mm -hmm. um, I can say that there's issues with health literacy, which are steeped in this issue of lack of education and things that um, Dr. Donlin talked about earlier, where you know access to just basic um, human needs in terms of education preclude their ability to access healthcare. So I may spend you know half of the visit trying to get them on to the technology to just do the visit, which then reduces the time that I'm able to spend with the patient that has these chronic health issues. Um, obesity being one of them. Now there are there are workarounds. So then I, if I don't use our internal technology, I may use like the doximity technology where all the person has to do is press a button and they appear on my screen. Um, but I see this as a barrier and I don't, and whenever I ask, you know, within our system, like what type of instructions are they receiving? Are they at the eighth grade level and below so they can know how to access it? People mm -hmm. aren't thinking about these things. These things are written for us with multiple degrees and that's just not going to be um, how we need to access these communities. We know that the average level of education, believe it or not, in the US is actually eighth grade. So all of these things need to be written and accessible in such a way that we're getting into those communities, recognizing the barriers that they may have because telemedicine is going to continue to steadily increase. And when all the stocks went down at the beginning of COVID-19, the telemedicine stocks were going up because I'm sure as my colleagues can say on this, we have made, even for those patients or those docs that have been practicing medicine for 40 plus years that swore they would never go into telemedicine, they're having to deliver care via that mechanism to account for the physical distancing and things that we're having to do to protect um, the health of, of those patients. So that's that's one of the strategies, I think. Thank you. Uh, Nicole, if it's okay, I think I have one question I think it would be great to end with. It's um, from Alicia, and I'd like to first to have uh, Tara and Brian tee this question up. It's given the next generation and dealing with education, and I imagine many of the uh, folks on our uh, webinar are students, healthcare students. So here's the question. How can we implement change at the educational level, medical school, PA school, residents, to combat the upbringing uh, of racism biases in the next generation of healthcare providers? So. I'll let you guys, uh, Tara and Brian, speak into this. Um, I think part of it is, especially in like the healthcare settings and in the education, to bring in people of color, different races, different backgrounds, different experiences in small group settings. It's one thing to sit in a huge lecture hall where you uh, are hearing someone speak, but I think to just be able to engage in a smaller environment where you can actually engage them back and forth with conversation would be extremely beneficial. It begins to start that conversation. It's just the beginning. I mean, that's barely the tip of the iceberg. I think um, there are gonna be perhaps other opportunities like in, in bigger communities, like where Dr. Donlin is working in some of the bigger settings, having rotations and opportunities where you can work in those underserved areas. Uh, have that perspective and that awareness um, is going to be really important. If you never have to work in those environments, how do you begin to understand what the needs might be? And I'd piggyback off that um, as an educator, but also just trying to raise our two boys is it goes back to being intentional. And if your leadership in those places is intentional, uh, they will have that as a main focus and to remind them of being intentional about that is what we can do to change their perspective and actually change that education in all areas. Very good. You Unless know, one I, of the things I want to 
piggyback off of that, Brian and Tara. As a matter of fact, I do want to mention this. Um, when I was in residency, Brian and Tara Frakes were some of the people who I could confide in in some of my struggles learning how to acclimate in very difficult situations. So long before they had their sons, they were already on the forefront in um, bridging gaps and making um, um, uh, uh, racial uh, relationships a thing. So I, I just wanted to publicly thank you guys for that because I'm still learning from you. You guys are amazing. But um, um, one of the things I wanted to say is I also think it has to do with the way that we choose the people who are matriculating into these medical schools and residencies and areas. You know, we sometimes, a lot of times what's used now is we, we look at a score and um, check a few boxes and then come on in. I think it's gonna, you're gonna have to be more deliberate. You're gonna have to look at a person's background and look at the whole picture and really ask yourself, what is the direction that I want my medical school and my residency or my university? What direction do I want this to go in? And if you want it to go in a particular direction that's inclusive on many different levels and that's diverse and where you have the different levels of understandings already built into the program, then you have to be, just to piggyback off what Brian and Tara said, you gotta be intentional. You gotta pick people who already are living that experience and bring them in. And I'm not saying everybody has to be like that. Some people have, maybe haven't had those opportunities, but they at least have to show a sincere, uh, earnest desire to want to learn to be amongst people who have those views and have those values so that we can address these. Because I agree with you, if we're waiting to address the racial disparities in healthcare um, in the hospital systems, then you're right, we're hitting it from the back end when we really need to get in front of it and help make sure that we're, we're training people so that they're sent, uh, culturally and racially sensitive on for, uh, at the beginning. Fantastic. Um, well, we are coming towards the, uh, the tail end. Um, thank you all for being a part of this webinar. I've post, I put up here a, a slide that uh, kind of illustrates some of the resources. Um, I've been uh, watching a series uh, by Jamar Tis Tisby on the color of compromise. And he talks about three parts of, of how we can take action. The first is awareness, which we're doing today, which would, you know, learning and being aware, self-aware self relationship. Amari, you touched on relationship, that component. Uh, but the other component is commitment. Mm. And we're making a commitment beyond just this webinar to continue. Yes this not only discussion, but pressing in on this issue. And so you're gonna hear and have the opportunity to uh, hear about more opportunities uh, and ways to engage. And so we'll be in communication. This is just uh, one of many opportunities for us to, uh, to have this time and to press in on this issue. So uh, I wanna thank you all for having taken the time, Nicole. Thank you for being a, a co-moderator, being a part of this together. Uh, thank you all for attending. Um, we've come to the tail end of our time. Uh, this is recorded. We're going to be posting it, and it will be made available if you want to go back to it and review it. And uh, we have your email addresses, those of you who registered. So, again, we'll be in contact as, uh, as, things, uh, as things move on. And, Nicole, do you have any closing thoughts? This was excellent. And I'm so pleased with everyone's uh, insight shared and the number of questions we have. I'm so pleased that it's on the hearts of many of you to want to know how do we how do we do this. So look forward uh, to continue the conversation with you all, and I'll soon close us in prayer. But look forward to continue the conversation. And many thank you to our panelists and CMDA mm -hmm. to our, our attendees today. And uh, please do share this with others um, when it's posted in our uh, CMDA Student Life page. Well, Nicole, then would you do just that? Uh, let's close in prayer. Thank you. Okay. Uh, sure, and thank you, Bill. Before I close this in prayer, I want to read a quick uh, African proverb shared in the book, Gracism, which is posted here on the webinar resource page. Uh, and it's a brief, uh, a brief uh, African proverb that you may have heard before, but it reads like this. When I saw him from afar, I thought he was a monster. When he got closer, I thought he was just an animal. When he got closer, I recognized that he was human. When we were face to face, I realized that he was my brother. Mm. Praying that whether far or nearby, we may recognize all those created in God's image as our brother or our sister. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this time together and the hearts that are gathered here today, the hearts that were gathering, uh, you know, even before this became uh, materialized. 
Lord, I, I know that hearts are hurting, hearts are heavy. Lord, you are a God of justice. Lord, you are a God that sees all, understands all. Lord, you are a hearing and prayer answering God. Lord, I thank you for the hearts that have come here, Lord, in earnest and wanting to know how we can do this better, Lord, how we can truly advance your kingdom in the earth, how we can truly mirror Christ in our calling and our vocations, Lord, as we serve one another, Lord, as we serve those created in your image. Lord, help us to press in and seek your face on what you would have us to do. Let us seek and pursue your ways, Lord, and help us really, Lord, yield ourselves to your solutions, not ours, Lord, but your solutions, Lord. Help us call on you, Lord, to really find out what we can do, Lord, to truly be the hands and feet of Christ in this time to reverse racism's effects on health and health care. Lord, I thank you for each person. I thank you for each household. Lord, I thank you for the gifts that are represented here, the different talents and abilities that are represented here. May we confidently walk in our gifts and our callings, Lord, to do just that, to individually and collectively uh, serve you and, and uh, really depart and really deploy the gifts and talents, Lord, to uh, really advance your kingdom in the earth. Lord, in these dark days and times, we are one body, one, one body of which is the church. Lord, but we all want many parts. But Lord, so we, may we just be with the one body, collectively united in, in Christ, but operating in our gift, various gifts and abilities, Lord, to truly uh, be the church in this time. Lord, we also lift up in prayer the families of Ahmad Aubrey, of George Floyd, of Breonna Taylor, and the many others who have lost their lives to violence, Lord, and to, uh, to hate and to racism. We also lift up the families of those who are mourning loved ones who have lost, uh, passed to the pandemic of COVID-19. Lord, we just ask that you would comfort and come near to our those who are hurting. We also lift up a special prayer for our young people, our students who are experiencing and witnessing this in this time. Lord, I pray that you would comfort and keep them, Lord. Be near them, Lord, and help them to truly see their, their, their purpose, Lord, in, in you. Lord, we pray that as we prepare to disciple this next generation of healthcare professionals, our young people, that they would keep you at the forefront and that they would also have hearts that want to serve you and those created in your image. In your son, Jesus, mighty, precious, and holy name, we say thank you and amen. Thank you, Nicole. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Amen.